how it goes. Hello, everybody. Hi. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. My name is Mark, and this is my sister in Christ, Elisa. <laughs> Elisa. How are you doing? We're excited for us to be here that, and talking about this lesson. In fact, this is the, the 12th lesson of 13 for this quarter, um, and, and we've been studying the, the quarterly called In the Crucible with Christ. It's a deep study of how and why crucibles occur, what we do inside those crucibles, why we have them, how do we stay connected with Jesus. And this week's title is called Dying Like a Seed, you know, and how we can accept God's will for our lives and the abundance that follows. But before we begin, I'd ask that we, we first will start this off in prayer, and I think Elisa will, will do that sure. for us. Thank you. That'd be great. Dear Father in heaven, I thank you, Lord, for this time together with you and to worship with your family uh, this Sabbath day. I pray that your Holy Spirit will be here as we open your word and learn these truths and think about how it applies to our lives, Lord. And we pray that you will guide us and strengthen us in you um, as we go through this and, and, and beyond. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Dying like a seed. Um, we're going to start out with our memory verse, but we'll do a little bit more than our memory verse. In fact, I wanted to put the memory verse into the context of the full parable, or pretty close to the full parable that Jesus talks about in this memory verse. So our memory verse is actually John 12, verses 24, but we're going to read John 12, 23 to 26. Let's start out there. But Jesus answered them, saying, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, and this is our memory verse in 24, most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. Ellen White says in um, Christ Object Lessons, page 86, she talks about the meaning of this memory verse, this memory verse being John verses 24. Let's read what she says. By the casting of the grain into the soil, Christ represents the sacrifice of himself for redemption. Let's read 24 again. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. As, and Ellen White continues and she says, so the death of Christ will result in fruit for the kingdom of God. In accordance to the law of the vegetable kingdom, life will be the result of his death. In fact, Jesus continues on in, in this, in, in John, and, she, and he says much the same thing. Let's read John 27 and 28. He says, now my, and now my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came for, to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Jesus talking about how he needs to do this for man. And in John 12, verses 30, he says this. Now, the judgment of the, of, now, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. Jesus fore, fore, foretolling that, that he is going to have to die for our sins and that he will be saving all of us. But the parable of Jesus dying on the cross, it's also a fascinating analogy of our submission and how we could submit to God's will. Let's read about this. Let's talk about this a little bit further. First, there's the falling of the kernel from the wheat. This falling is uncontrolled as it falls to the ground. The stalk is what we know, but then this kernel falls out of that onto the ground. Then there's the waiting. The kernel hits the ground. The kernel lies on the earth and the soil. It does not know the future as it lies there. And then finally, there's the dying. The kernel cannot possibly come a wheat unless it gives it 
unless it gives up its safe, comfortable situation as a colonel. It must die. It has to give up all this so that it can be transformed to a seed into a fruit-bearing plant. Now, Jesus talks about it, but this is also our path that we can do to help spread God's word while we're waiting for the second coming. In this week's lesson on Sunday, we're going to discuss submission for service as taught to us from Paul and Philippians. In Monday, Elisa is going to talk about Paul and discussing our need for it as a living sacrifice. And then on Tuesday, we're going to dig into the story of Samuel and Eli and his sons and the importance of listening to God. On Wednesday, we're going to go continue in Saul, the, the one Saul and talk, I mean, one Samuel and talk about Saul and his issues with self-reliance and, and maybe our issues too. And on Thursday, we're going to talk about the focuses of dangers of following other gods and idols. And finally, on Friday, we'll wrap this up. So on Sunday, let's dig into Sunday, and I'll start that off. And um, the idea is that, I mean, if you look around the world, people are talking about rights a lot. Um, I don't know if you, you hear about this, the rights of this group, or the rights of that group, or my God-given rights. What does Jesus say about this? Oh, amazingly, John actually says that maybe this is not the most important. We may need to give up our rights. In fact, to submit to service in this lesson, we're going to talk about how we need to be submit our lives for service to Jesus by serving others, by humbling ourselves to others and God, and actually rejecting glory and even giving up our rights. So we're going to go into Philippians, and John had a lot to say to the Philippians, and we're going to start in Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4, and he says this, and let's read what he says. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. It's an interesting conversation when you have, when you're talking about rights and you're saying, oh, these are my rights. But wouldn't it be a little bit different? Is that what can I do to help you in your struggles? Or what about this, have this idea that you're walking down the street and say, that person is better than I am. That's a different, it puts it in a completely different situation. In fact, Jesus, I mean, Paul had more to say in Philippians 2, verses 5 to 9, even greater than what we just, what she mentioned here in Philippians 3 and 4. Let's read uh, Philippians 2, verses 5 through 9. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Jesus Christ. Let me stop there. What he's, Paul is saying is that let us be, let's try to think as Jesus thought here. And let's go on in 6. He says, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of man. And being found in appearance as man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God has all highly exalted him and given him the name which is above all names. So John, I mean, Paul is very, very clear. He says, we must have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. In Philippians 2, verses 6 and 7, Jesus says, what has he done here? He was equal to God. He says, you know, I consider it's not robbery to be equal to God. But he made himself, he, he said, I'm going to lose my rights as being equal to God, and I'm going to come and be a servant to man. And in 2.8, he says, not only that, he humbled himself. He humbled himself and was obedient to death, and not just any death. Probably the most humiliating type of death, painful type of death that had happened here. So what rights are you holding on to that could be a barrier to you submitting God's will and serving for your family, your church, or, or your people, co-workers at work? Are you willing to you know, endure discomfort to serve others more effectively. And the result of this is Philippians 2, verses 9. Let's read that again. It says here, Therefore God has wholly exalted in him and given him the name which is above every name, 
As a result, we will have an opportunity to be with Jesus. Paul is discussing Jesus in these terms and how we are to mimic him. It shows us that God's nature is not one to demand respect, to maintain his rights and power. Jesus was just the opposite. God was just the opposite. His love was so confident. All he wanted was the best for us, and he showed us this by humbling and submitting his son to death for our sins. Submission is one way that we can die to seed. Let's jump over to Tuesday and uh, Monday. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> and Elisa will talk about the title as Dying Comes Before Knowing God's Will. Lisa? Okay, thank you. sure. Thank you. And, you know, that example that you discussed about Jesus, you know, and the example he gave us, how he, he gave up his right to be, you know, with God. Yeah. You yeah. know, and, and be God um, and came down here to be a human. Yeah. Right? Um, the topic I'm going to cover today for Monday is a lot easier to um, accept if we remember what Christ did for us, right? Yeah. So dying comes before knowing God's will. Have you wondered what God's will is in your life or for a certain situation in your life? Yeah, you know, I know I have. Mm -hmm. And many people sincerely seek to know God's will, but the answers don't always come immediately. And understanding God's will for us may even seem confusing. Sometimes the most challenging part of doing God's will is not knowing the why behind it. There are a number of Bible characters that may have also wondered what God's will and purpose was in their circumstances. So, you know, I can think of Abraham, for, for instance, being asked to sacrifice his son Isaac. Or Joseph, who was sold as a slave to a heathen nation. So, you know, they may have been wondering, what is God's will in this? In Romans 12, 1 and 2, Paul describes how we can know God's will. So let's read that together. In verse 1 it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And then in verse 2 he says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. So Paul makes the point that if we want to know God's will, we have to sacrifice first. This is our service to God. These texts lay out the process by which this happens. So first, we have an understanding and appreciation of God's mercy towards us. Second, we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice to God. And then third, our minds are renewed, and it is the renewing of our minds that helps us to truly understand God's will. So why is our sacrifice necessary? In James 4.4, 4, we read that friendship of the world is enmity with God and that whoever is a friend of the world is the enemy of God. But God does not leave us in this condition. Going on to verse 5 and 6 of James 4, we read, Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, The spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. I heard a preacher say that the human heart is a fantastic factory of idols. Indeed, our natural hearts yearn for all kinds of desires and paradises and pleasures that may not be in harmony with God. We were created to worship, and the natural heart has self on the throne, not God. So it is a struggle and a sacrifice to remove self from the throne and allow God to take that place in our hearts. Jesus understood this struggle that we have with self. In Matthew 16, 24 to 26, he said, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. 
For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And in Luke 14.33, Jesus said, So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. The lesson encourages us to prayerfully and humbly ask the Holy Spirit to show us areas within us that are not completely dead. What are those things we need to give up in order to become a living sacrifice for God? This is a difficult task, but we are not asked to do something that Christ um, did not do already for us. His sacrifice was even so much more than what that is, which is asked of us. In 1 Peter 2.21, we read, Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. The process of surrender deepens our understanding of the cross and the sufferings of Christ. This process of surrender may bring us into crucibles as we confront our sins and allow the Holy Spirit to lead us through our struggles of dethroning self. The Bible tells us we are not left alone in this struggle. In Philippians 4.13, Paul writes, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Elizabeth Elliot, in her book, Quest for Love, writes, The surrender of our heart's deepest longing is perhaps as close as we come to an understanding of the cross. Our own experience of crucifixion, though immeasurably less than our Savior's, nonetheless furnishes us with a chance to begin to know him in the fellowship of his sufferings. In every form of our own suffering, he calls us into that fellowship. So is this struggle worth it? Paul writes about this based on his own experience in Philippians 3, 7, and 8. And that says, But what things were gained to me, these things I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. Go back to you. Yeah, Mel's up. I mean, thank you, Elisa. I mean, it seems to me when you're discussing dying comes before knowing God's will, it seems to me it's almost like we have this hill in front of us, and it looks like a pretty tough hill. But it seems, you've pointed out that as we do it and we engage, God and the Bible promises have given us so much ammunition that we can get over that hill and then start cruising down. And, uh, but it takes a little bit of effort, and, but it's not as bad as we think. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> well, sometimes it may be pretty bad, but we are assured that Christ will bring us through it. Amen. Amen. <laughs> On Tuesday, um, we, could you talk a little bit about willingness and the importance of willingness to listen? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the Bible gives us quite a number of examples of God communicating to his people. Sometimes that communication comes through people, such as prophets or church leaders. Sometimes through heavenly messengers. We think of Mary, who had the angel come and visit her. We also have uh, examples where God and comes directly face-to-face, -face, like with Abraham, or in a vision, like with Daniel. And we know that he communicates through his word, the scriptures. But there's also a still small voice. Um, and, and, you know, I'm pretty sure most of us, if not all of us, have heard that still small voice from time to time. And it directs us in a path that we should take. When God speaks to us, how willing are we to listen and follow what he is telling us? The lesson discusses the experience of the boy Samuel who heard and was obedient to God's voice. And then it contrasts that with Samuel's response to that of Eli's sons, who did not listen and they did not obey. So this powerful story is found in 1 Samuel 2.12 through 3.21. And it has many lessons for us today. The ultimate outcome of those who listen and obey God 
versus those who don't are clearly laid out. It is a sobering story, but also filled with hope for those who truly seek God and submit their lives to him. So we will look at the main points from this story together, but I encourage you to take the time and read through the entire story when you can. So chapter 2 tells us of the wickedness of Eli's sons, how they defiled the sacrifices that the people brought for their own gluttony, and they threatened the people who did not give them what they demanded, and they practiced adultery with the temple women, just like the heathen nations around them. Even though they were priests of the Levitical line, they lived in open rebellion to God, satisfying their selfish desires as they pleased without concern for their future or of how their actions affected the Israelites. In, in verse 24 of 1 Samuel chapter 2, it tells us that they made the Lord's people transgress. From the text, we also read how Eli did little to intervene and uphold what was right. God in no way excused Eli's lax response to his son's actions. In 1 Samuel 2.12, it says, Now the sons of Eli were corrupt. They did not know the Lord. Verse 27 to 36 then records God's judgment on Eli and his household for their unrepentant sins. And let's read through that, starting with verse 27. Then a man of God came to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Did I not clearly reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? Did I not choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon my altar to burn incense, and to wear an ephod before me? And did I not give to the house of your father all of the offerings of the children of Israel made by fire? Why do you kick at my sacrifice and my offering which I have commanded in my dwelling place and honor your sons more than me to make yourselves fat with the best of the offerings of Israel my people? Therefore the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever. But now the Lord says, far be it from me, for those who honor me I will honor, and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days are coming that I will cut off your arm and the arm of your father's house, so that there will, be, there will not be an old man in your house." And you will see an enemy in my dwelling place, despite all the good which God does for Israel. And there shall not be an old man in your house forever. But any of your men whom I do not cut off from my altar shall consume your eyes and grieve your heart. And all the descendants of your house shall die in the flower of their age. Now this shall be a sign to you that will come upon your two sons, on Hophni and Phinehas. In one day they shall die, both of them. Then I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before my anointed forever. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left in your house will come and bow down to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread and say, please put me in one of the priestly positions that I may eat a piece of bread. So as a result of their hard hearts and apostasy, the wonderful priesthood inheritance was taken from Eli and his household, and the temporal lives of Eli's sons and many of the descendants were cut off at an early age. In contrast, the Bible records this of the boy Samuel. In 1 Samuel 2.26, it says, And the child Samuel grew in stature and in favor both with the Lord and with men. Similar to what the scriptures would later record about the child Jesus. In chapter 3, 
We then read of the Lord calling Samuel one night. Samuel, hearing God calling, thinks it is Eli and goes at once to Eli, who tells Samuel that he has not called him and to go lie back down. This happens three times. And then Eli perceives that the Lord is calling Samuel, and so he instructs Samuel and says, say, the next time this happens, says, speak, Lord, for your servant heareth. The Lord tells Samuel, <clears throat> calls Samuel again the fourth time, and that time Samuel responds as Eli had instructed. The Lord then tells Samuel of what he will perform against Eli and his household. So let's pick up the story again at verse 11 through 14 of chapter 3. And it says, Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do something in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. In that day I will perform against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows because his, sin, his sons made themselves vile and he did not restrain them. And therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. At the end of the chapter, the Bible then records the outcome of Samuel in verses 19 um, through chapter 4, verse 1. And it reads, Then Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. Then the Lord appeared again to Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord, and the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Because of his openness and obedience to God, Samuel received the blessing that had been taken from Eli and his household. And as I close out this day, I'll just read one quote from Charles Stanley in his book, From the Wonderful Spirit-Filled Life. He said, um, he, he describes how important it is for us to cultivate this openness of hearing God's voice and a spirit of obedience and he writes, the Holy Spirit does not speak for the sake of passing along information. He speaks to get a response. And he knows when our agenda has such a large slice of our attention that it is a waste of time to suggest anything to the contrary. When that is the case, he is often silent. He waits for us to become neutral enough to hear and eventually to obey. So let's go on to Wednesday and talk about self-reliance. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the, I wanted to kind of start this off with a question. Does God's word ever not apply? Have you ever had times when you rationalized that his word didn't apply here? Or maybe he meant something else. Or even worse, we'll do it right the next time. Well, you're not alone. Eve also had these same issues way back in the beginning. And let's read in Genesis 3, verses 3 to 6 to remind ourselves this. But the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, the tree desirable to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave it to her husband, and he ate. So we know that, of course, Eve's issue, Eve's issue was that she didn't listen to God. But it was more than that, okay? She thought she was wise enough to determine what was good and right. She trusted her own judgment and not God. In fact, she replaced God with self-reliance, and that's what we're going to dig more into. Now, Eve is not the only one. Um, I, I, I have a tendency, we, I, many of us probably have a tendency on self-reliance. But Saul, we're going to dig into the story of Saul, first king of Israel, 
was also a victim of self-reliance. And, and we're going to study a little bit about the tragedy that follows after that self-reliance. Samuel and um, Samuel um, and anoints Saul as the first king of Israel. On 1 Samuel 10, chapter 10, verse 1, Samuel says this, Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his hand, on his head, and kissed him and said, It is not because the Lord has anointed you commander of his inheritance. He was anointing him as the king. Then he gave Saul, Samuel gave Saul specific instructions from God. In 1 Samuel 10, verses 8, he says, You shall go down before me to Gilgad, and surely I will come down to you to offer burnt offerings and make sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait till I come to you and show you what you should do. So let's read what Saul says. He gets the instructions. There's a lot going on here. It's a pretty intense story that we're going to dig a little bit further into. We're going to go over to 1 Samuel uh, chapter 13, verses 1 through 14, and talk about the predicament that Saul's in and his decisions that he makes. So Saul reigned one year, and, and when he went, had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose for himself 3,000 men of Israel. 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash and in the mountains of Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan in Gilbeah of Benjamin. The rest of the people he sent away, every man to his tent. And Jonathan attacked the garrisons of the Philistines that were in Geba. And the Philistines heard of this. Then Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. Now all Israel heard it said that Saul had attacked the garrison of the Philistines, and that Israel had also become an abomination to the Philistines. And the people were called together to Saul in Gilgad. Let's break down. Saul is trying to gather people in Israel to go against the Philistines. But what do the Philistines do? We're going to read on and see on, in, chapter, in verse 5. Then the Philistines gathered together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen, and the people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and encamped in Michmash to the east of Beth Aven. Then the men of Israel saw that they were in danger, for the people were distressed. Then the people hid in caves and thickets and rocks and holes and in pits. And some of the Hebrews crossed over the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was in Gilgad and the people followed him trembling. It's a tough situation he's finding himself. You can imagine this. Thousands, 10 to 1 ratio here. And he's just in Gilgad. So Saul waited, and let's revert, continue on in verse 8. Then he waited seven days, according to the time that's set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgad, and the people were scattered before him. So Saul said, bring the burnt offering and the priest offering here to me. And he offered the burnt offering. Now it happened, as soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering, that Samuel came and Saul went out to see him, that he might greet him. Not so bad. He almost did what Samuel said. What does Samuel respond in verse 11? What have you done? Saul said, when, you, when I saw the people were scattered before me, Saul said, when I saw the people that were scattered before me and that he had co not come within the days appointed that the Philistines gathered together in Michmash, then I said, the Philistines will now come down on me in Gilgad and I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore, I felt compelled and I offered a burnt offering. And we'll continue. And Samuel, Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established a kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord sought for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people because you have not kept the word of the Lord commanded to you. What it says right here, it says, what's that commandment, right? Uh, the commandment of the Lord. You haven't done this. Remember we said he almost said what? He, he was almost there, but God was very specific. Wait until Samuel gets there. Samuel is the prophet. He can lead the sacrifices. So what did Saul do? Saul saw danger. He was scared. He was worried. He saw his, his, his soldiers and people scattered around, and he felt compelled to perform the offering instead disobeying God's direct command to him. In fact, if we read in, in chapter 13, verse 11, we see a lot 
of what could happen to us in these cases. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 11, first he says, I, when I saw, and then he says, and then, then I said, the Philistines now come down to me, and that I have made supplication to the Lord. Therefore, I felt compelled an offering, a burnt offering. So all these things, all about I. You know, I, I, I saw this, I was scared. I said, this is my human eyes. But God knew what was happening. And as Samuel said, if he had listened to God, he would have had everything. But instead, he would, have, he would lose the people. Okay. In a sense, you do blame call. I mean, I think it was a pretty scary situation, okay? But that's the idea, is that is there ever a case where God's word is not correct? No, it always is correct. But what we don't see and what, Samuel's, uh, what Saul's issue was is that he was relying on his own judgment, not on the judgment of God. How do we avoid this? How do we avoid this from happening to us? I'm, I'm sure this, these types of things happen to me I don't know, so many of us are self-reliant. One of the ways to do it is we can recognize and learn from stories like this, like Eve and, and like Saul. Another one is, is, it reminds me of what Moses said in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6, verses 4. He said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. If you focus your time and your effort on loving God, getting to know him, that trust in anything that happens before you, the trust that we talked about, Abraham and Joseph, they, they're just going to come to you naturally. This is how we die like a seed, okay? By trusting in the Lord with all our hearts and all our souls. Thank you. Um, on Thursday, we're going to dig in, and Lisa, you'll, you'll help us with substitutes. Yeah, sounds great. So as humans, we tend to seek stability and consistency in our environment so that we can more effectively plan and predict how to go about our day and what our future is. So we desire control over what is coming and how the events are going to play out. Whether it's in the workplace or in our personal lives, ambiguity, large-scale change, and chaos, they tend to make us anxious and uncomfortable. So this lesson touches on the topic of substitutes, those things we rely on when things seem out of control. Instead of going to God and trusting in Him to work out our circumstances, we try to find comfort in our substitutes. It's our way of hiding from or coping with the chaotic world around us to relieve the pressure we feel. But instead of solving the problem or teaching us how to handle the situation, these substitutes are just a crutch that enables our dependence on self-reliance. The lesson discusses three common substitutes that we may be relying on instead of of God. So number one, it says using human logic or past experience when in Instead, we need to a fresh uh, divine revelation. Number two, blocking problems out of our minds when what we really need is divine solutions. And number three, seeking to escape reality and avoid God when what we really need is communion with him for his divine power. The Bible provides us with tremendous counsel for how we should navigate those troublesome circumstances if, in our life by trusting in God and relying on him to work out his will for us. A good example comes from the story of the rebuilding of Jerusalem after the Jewish exiles left Babylon. The people were facing much opposition from the regional inhabitants and the work even stalled for a time because the opposition was so great. God intervened to encourage the people and Zerubbabel, who was leading the rebuilding efforts, through a message he gave to Zechariah. You can read Zechariah's vision in Zechariah 4, and we will focus on a few of the verses for our study. Um, let's read Zechariah 4, 5 through 9. Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. 
So he answered and said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple, and his hand shall also finish it. Then you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. So just as in the time of Zechariah and the rebuilding of Jerusalem, the sovereign Lord who raises up and takes down nations and kings wants us to come to him with our troublesome circumstances. He wants to lead us through these times and work out his will for us so that we can go through these crucibles and perform his will. The more we submit ourselves and surrender our will and our substitutes to God, the more that we will notice that we are actually free. And in closing, I'll give some final thoughts <laughs> from Ellen Waite. Uh, from Ellen White, um, which she writes in Review and Herald back in 1899, she says, The Lord would have every soul strong in his strength. He would have us look to him, receiving our directions from him. Yep. To kind of like close today's lesson, you know, really we've been talking about how death to sin is a solution to death. In fact, if we read in, in, the, in the gospel, Romans 6, verses 23, it's clearly it shows here, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of, of eternal life is Jesus our Lord. In fact, I wanted to read in also, this is the, the last, to kind of close this out, I want to read this in Romans, what Paul says about this, and just read this in detail and, and, and talk about this idea that in order to survive death, we need to die to self. In Romans 6, verses 5 through 11, he says, For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he died, for he who died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ... We believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ has been raised up from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Fun lesson today. So, thank you guys for joining. Home. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> tough. It's tough at times, yeah. but it helps home. It was good. There's a lot to learn there. Thank you guys for our lesson today. And let me finish with prayer. Okay, dear Lord, we've had a great, a great day here digging into your Sabbath school lesson. This twelve of thirteen and this quarterly dying, like a seed. And we study about how to submit to you, willingness to listen. We've studied those characters, those people in the Bible that have given us examples to, to follow and not follow, to uh, be warned about, to learn. And we've, you've shown us wonderful promises that that hills ahead of us is just a small hill, that eventually you'll be there with us every step of the way. Help us as we learn to die like a seed so that we have that better relationship with you and we can spread your word and, and your seeds to others so that they can also grow and be nourished by you. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. <laughs>